Sorry about that. Amen. How about that? All right, let's get the Bibles open now. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Thank you for all the good good uh, comments been made about our Wednesday evening Bible study. And so what we're doing on Wednesday night is about, I'm not about half teach, half preach sort of a thing, trying to uh, teach a little bit more of the Bible, verse by verse. And, and I have absolutely just been amazed, as always, as I read these scriptures. I studied it today, and uh, I've been looking at this all day long and praying and getting out of my prayer closet today and prayed and spent some time with the Lord. And my, my, of uh, 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 107 times read the New Testament and probably the book of Philippians several more, a bunch more times than that, and you're still, something just jumps out at you and grabs you you never really thought about before. And that's, that's the most amazing book on planet Earth, y'all. And we cheat ourselves. By, by just not spending more time in God's Word. We have, uh, we have uh, Skylar, she's back yonder in the, in the uh, class tonight, and she's already finished her Bible. How old is she, like 15, 14, 15? And uh, done read her Bible through the last two years, and that's great. And we will be having everybody up that's read the Bible all the way through here on, uh, I guess that's December the 31st, I reckon, right, on Sunday. And uh, the last Sunday in December, so we're looking forward to that. Can't wait. We always have a gang lined up from here all the way over yonder of people that read the Bible all the way through. And uh, uh, I've heard people criticize that. I've heard preachers, I guess they feel guilty or something. I don't know. Like, I don't care how many times you read the Bible. Well, uh, it ain't going to hurt you. You might not have an alert spirit on every single time you read it. But i tell you one thing, you'll never go wrong by reading this book. And you pray, God, let me be in the right spirit as I read it. And read it right. Makes a difference how you read it. Bible's like a chainsaw, buddy. Uh, somebody don't know what they're doing with a chainsaw can do a lot of damage. And at, uh, at the Word of God, you know you know how to use a chainsaw and you can make something that looks like a bear like they do in Gatlinburg. That's, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Well, they take a chainsaw and, and, whittle, and make it look like a bear. Wasn't nothing but a stump. And uh, so uh, that's what the Word of God can do if you know how to use it. Philippians chapter 2. Now, we finished last week about that verse on suffering there in verse 29 of chapter 1. It is given to you in behalf of Christ, not just to believe on Him, but to suffer for His sake. And when you think about it, everything we've got, our cars, this building, our clothes, our refrigerator, our stove, our house, our heating system, is all to make this flesh comfortable. That's all it is. And we don't like suffering. We don't like it. I don't like it. Nobody likes it. But uh, as a Christian, if you're going to live right, uh, there will be some things you're going to have to suffer. I mean, that's all there is to it. You're not going to get out of it. And it, it ain't just normal life that happens to everybody. It's things that you suffer for His sake. You might be the outcast of your family. Uh, you might be the... Uh, they might talk about you bad at work. They might say bad things about you when you go on, you know, when you're around people stuff. That ain't gonna, my goodness, that ain't going to hurt you. Uh, the early Christians, they'd beat to death. So uh, don't, don't let it kill you if you have to suffer a little bit. It's given to you. It's given to you to suffer. Now, let's start in chapter 2 tonight. And chapter 2, just about the entire chapter is about humility in service. And uh, serving God with a humble heart and mind, and, and living for other people. In other words, completely backwards for what our generation believes and teaches, and, and as usual. So tonight, let's look in chapter 2 and verse 1. If there be any, therefore any, consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now, quickly, right quickly, consolation, comfort, fellowship, all of that. In other words, uh, Paul was saying, fulfill you my joy. You know what he said? He said, the thing that makes me happier than anything is to hear that y'all are, are getting along with each other, that you got love, have bowels of mercy. We studied that word bowels. That's another word that the, the medical profession has twisted and perverted. 
and made it not the Bible definition. The Bible and the correct definition of bowel is like a bowl. See that word bowl in it? The ins- all your inside. In the Bible, all of our inside are bowels. They've changed it now so that bowels just are just uh, uh, a certain part of your body uh, used for uh, uh, elimination. And uh, that's not the correct definition of that word. And if you're not careful, you'll, there's a lot of words in the Bible like that, that that our modern day group has given new meaning to. But you're better off to stick to the Bible definition of a word. Always. Uh, like the word gay, for example. It don't mean homosexual at all. Never has. Until just all of a sudden they decide they want to make it that. Uh, uh, like like other words that are are words that people have made cuss words out of, but they're not cuss words in about like hell and damn. Those are not really cuss words unless you use them as one. And uh, there is a hell. And there, you know, the Bible says, you believe it or not, you shall be damned. That's the correct meaning of those words. And you see how the devil, he's slick, man. He made that, he makes so that, I've, I've been, I've, I've preached to bus kids before and they thought I was cussing. I was talking, you know, they thought, oh, he's cussing. And because they don't even know that and the word bowels is like that bowels that all of your inside like a bowl like a bowl that's what it is uh so uh bowels and mercy fulfill ye my joy uh he's uh he's taken for granted that this would be normal in a church now i want to say something about this about fellowship of the spirit comfort of love like-minded same love one accord, one mind. When everybody in the church gets right with the Lord, we get like that. I've seen it many times. And I'm telling you, the more divisions and bickering and fussing and, and arguing you got in the church, that's a sign of more backslid people. The more backslid you get, the more you want to disagree and fuss about stuff. Uh, when people get right with the Lord, their differences just melt. I've seen it over and over and over. I've seen, I've watched it at camp, and I'll see like two girls that hate each other because one of them stole the other boyfriend, and really she ought to buy, bake her a cake for taking that jerk off her hands. But uh, they, but they, uh, they, they hate each other, and then the Holy Ghost move in, and everybody's at the altar crying, and they're up there hugging, they I'm sorry, I'll you. you know, like that. That's what the Lord did. And you know, when when we really have a, a streak of revival come through or a, a touch from the Lord, people, people. I don't mean you always agree on everything, but you have a soft heart toward each other. And that's what he's saying. Fulfill you my joy. Say the same love. One accord. One mind. Now, of all the groups that you're involved in, listen, of all the groups that you're a part of, like most of you, your school, your kids' school, you have a group, uh, their parents and the other kids' parents and, and, and kids that your kids go to school with, Sort of like group parents, it might be like for a a, a ball team, or it might be a, a, a group of uh, uh, ladies in your neighborhood that do stuff together, or it might be maybe uh, a group at, at work. Many of you might have a group at work that you're a sort, you know, like a little group of people that does. You might be a bunch of guys at work, and y'all might go play golf uh, on on Saturday or sometime. Or uh, many people, many people are parts of little groups like that and that's totally okay as long as you keep the lord first i'm gonna tell you something your church family should come first and above all other secular groups that you might be a part of according to the bible according to the bible we're family we're brothers and sisters now our, our, my, my neighbors I, I like all my neighbors we get along good i we got a bunch of guys that live up there been living there for 30 and 40 50 years and we're all friends. Talked to one of them yesterday. And if they had a neighborhood gathering of all the hoppy tom big shots and said, we're going to have a cookout down here Sunday night, preacher, and we're going to cook hot dogs and fix food and we're going to come be a part of it. No, I'm not going. I'm not going. And I'm not not going because I'm a preacher. I'm not going because my family meets here on Sunday night. So I prefer my the church family above my other groups, activities, whatever. And I know, I know sometimes there's stuff and there's stuff at school and there's obligations and stuff like that. I, I ain't crazy. But uh, it, when you have a choice, uh, the Bible teaches 
that your brothers and sisters in Christ are your main group of people outside of your own immediate family. I'll tell you why, buddy, when it, come, when it comes time to die, uh, your church is the ones that are going to be there. When it comes time for uh, the, the, the kids to get married, the church will be there for the kids. When it comes time for all, all that stuff, all this kind of stuff like that, the church, and, and I'll, I'll say this too, the church should be the center of our kids' thought and as they grow up. Uh, it, it should be. And if you have the advantage of your kids going to a Christian school or homeschool, you are way ahead. You are way ahead because their life is built around people who, may, even if they're not a part of the church, believe like the church. I've always said that the way you get a kid to turn out right is they need to hear the same thing at school, home, and church. If the only time they ever hear it's at church and they don't hear it at home, school, that kid ain't got much of a chance. If the only time they hear it is at, at home and they don't go to church, they don't have much of a chance. And if, and, and if they hear it at home and church but not at school, that greatly decreases their chances. But if they hear it at home, school, and church, I go to school, I hear the same thing. There's a God, believe in Jesus. I go to church, there's a God, believe in Jesus. I go home, there's a God, believe in Jesus. You hear that in all three places. That's your best bet. That's your best bet. Have your kids turn out right? And I've heard people say, well, don't you think they'll rebel? You know, yeah, whatever. You'll never hurt them by telling them the truth and loving them and teaching them about the Word of God. Now, they might rebel, but it ain't because of the Bible. I've, I've had people used to tell me, said, now you see what happened to them people in Broughton? Half of them, the Bible drove them crazy. Uh, I want to tell you something, people. The Bible ain't never drove nobody crazy. God's Word don't drive people crazy. I tell you what will make you crazy. Is trying to read the Bible and sin at the same time. Now that'll make you nut a nut. That'll make you a fruitcake out of you. But the Word of God won't hurt you. The Word of God won't hurt you. Um, try to put it in them day and night. While you're coming to church, while you're going home to church, no matter, no matter what comes up, try to make something spiritual or Bible out of it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a perfect parent. I'm not a perfect parent. But God knows I've tried, boy, I've tried. When, when my girls was little, but it, I mean, it was Bible, 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 Bible. When they had their friends over, they all got in the living room floor, and they'd fix popcorn, and they'd be a gang of little girls about that high in the living room floor. And, and they'd always say, Daddy, come tell us a story. I'd get my Bible, and I, I, was, I tried to do just as good as I would if I was preaching to a thousand people. And I'd jump up on the, on, a, on the coffee table, and I was Goliath. And then I'd get way down here, and I was David. And, I, and there, everybody just wants to be like it. I, I, I was all over the place. I was narrating the story as I go and putting sound effects and <laughs> everything. In. You know, I want the Bible to be real to them. I want the Bible to be real to them. And if they watch the movie, make it a Bible movie. Why not? Why not? Uh, if, they, if, they, if they had an activity, put the Bible in it. That's one good thing about Christian schools. They put the Bible in every single subject one way or another, and subconsciously they're learning the Word of God. Math, English, uh, everything. That's where our country started out, by the way. Those old McGuffey readers and the King James Bible. And so uh, uh, that's what he's talking about here. Uh, let's have the same love. One accord, one mind. Look at the middle of verse 2. Having the same love. What do you reckon that means? The same love. What's that? Same love as, as who, what? For each other, I reckon? That's tough, ain't it? Love everybody the same as you love everybody. Being of one accord and of one mind. Look at verse 3. That's even worse. Uh, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now, back at verse 2 again, strife, uh, He's talking about don't have schisms uh, in the church or cliques, as we would call it. Uh, the schisms, inner, inner circle. Back years ago, up in Marion, we used to have all these young preachers. And we'd have like 15 young preachers set across the front row. And a bunch of young preachers like that are really, really can be a great blessing to a church. But they can also be a headache. And they get started arguing with each other. And they get, get a hold of some doctrine. And then one of them said, do you believe this? None said, do you believe that? None said, do you believe this? We had that at the camp meeting just a little bit. Not our guys. Uh, but, um, uh, and, 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 and fuss about doctrine. 
And while I appreciate their zeal and curiosity and desire to know the will of God, you cannot develop into little groups where we believe this and that little group believes that and we have nothing to do with you because you don't believe like we believe or you don't do that. That's schisms. And uh, young preachers and singers are really, really, really notoriously bad uh, for stuff like that, young Christians. So he said, everybody think alike. Everybody think alike. That don't mean we're cult, and that don't mean we're clones. You have the, the freedom to disagree on non-essentials. But it does mean, as far as church, as far as worship, our purpose on earth, our witness for the Lord, what is right and wrong, that we're to be in the same mind and one accord. Um, like one guy said, well, we're supposed to be all in one accord. How in the world do ever all them people get in a Honda? And that is not what he means. That's another one of them words that's changed the meaning. We're all not in one accord. Uh, you know, they try to, they, that baseball, you know where baseball's at in the Bible, right? In the beginning. Uh, and you know, we're a uh, shortest man in the Bible, Bill Dad the shoe high. <laughs> you know, people have all kind of little, little stories like that. But anyway, uh, let's, let's try to do this. Let's try to not get hung up on non-essentials that really don't make no difference at the end of the day either way and give each other a little grace to disagree on stuff, which we, we should, we should. But, I, but know where to draw the line and stay together in one mind, one accord. The only answer to that is the Spirit of God. That's the only way you're ever going to get a group of people to believe, agree on stuff is the Holy Ghost get a hold of. That's the only way. It's impossible otherwise. And then he said, don't let nothing, verse 3, be done through strife or vain glory. Now, what that means is, Anything we do at church, it should never be just so we can get glory out of it. Vain glory. Boy, if you, I tell you, I hate to say this, but if you took out all the vain glory stuff in a lot of church, you wouldn't have a whole lot left. I'm talking about the singing, the coming in, the coming out. I'm telling you, they walk in like their heads stuck up like they're going to trip over their uh, something being careful, like here I am, I'm the great, everybody's, you, you got to be careful about coming in thinking, all the women are looking at my new dress, I'm great, I'm wonderful, so, see how, that, you know, that's the wrong attitude to have, now you ought to dress nice, you know how you should dress, you should dress like a woman if you're a woman, you should dress like a man if you're a man, all of that, but you're not, it's not a fashion show, church is not supposed to be a fashion show, there are churches like that, where you got to dress up, high, uppity a little bit, you know, and, and that's not right. That's not right. And it shouldn't be for strife or vain glory. You shouldn't strut. Amen. Preachers, just as bad as anybody else. I've been to preachers meeting where they'll come in like this, you know. I'm not against holding your Bible like that, but I mean, come on, man. Hello, like you're a president or something. Uh, the, the truth is, we ain't nothing. Preacher ain't nothing special. Ain't nothing special. Uh, sometimes people say, I'm not, you should honor the position. And off, I got, I do, you know, I believe that. You should honor a preacher, his position, his office. But the man himself, ain't nothing, ain't no different than nobody else. Ain't nothing different than nobody else. We put our shoes on the same way everybody else does. And um, uh, I went to eat with some people one time. They had invited me over for dinner or something. And I got to their house and uh, I said, oh, where's, that, where's that little girl at? Or that their little boy? It might have been a little boy. And and the mom's coming out. She said, "He's in there. He's scared to death of you." And I said, "Why?" I thought, well, I, ain't, I don't even know if I've ever spoke to that kid. Why is he scared of me? And then she said, "He just didn't." And it hit me. The only time that kid ever seen me, he'd never seen me any other time except doing. And he, he thought I was going. He thought I was going to come in there and say, "Boy." Is your room clean? Show me right now. You know, that's why. And that, that, that was a picture they had of a preacher. Uh, I've had a lot of time people come and see me. Well, I worked there or something. Like, Brother Danny, I've never seen you in blue jeans. Brother, and they, they forget that. And singers are like that too. Singers are just about sickening. As some preachers, some singing groups, well, they're out there, you know, they ain't, a, they ain't a spiritual thought in their mind. And then all of a sudden they get all dressed up and come in on the front row and they get up here and say, oh, hallelujah, oh, praise the Lord. You know, what I'm saying? you want to throw up. I mean, it's like a, it's like vain glory. 
vain glory. And listen, people, y'all come here to our church, you're educated on music. You should be. There's a difference between somebody singing from their heart and then somebody trying to just show off their voice. There's a big difference. You know, uh, a guy's trying to sing opera or something. He says, my father is omnipotent. And that you can't deny a God of grace and miracles that is written in the sky. Oh, shut up. I, just, I mean, I'm not against a man having a lot of talent, but good night, y'all. Uh, uh, they, they, uh, and they get up there and like they're trying to make love to the microphone. And all you can hear is them breathing. Just sit down. Sit down. A bunch of flesh. It's a bunch of flesh. Amen. Just get up here. I, I teach our kids, if you just hear and open your mouth and sing just like you're looking at the Lord. Now, strife or vain glory. Vain glory. We don't have no peacocks around here strutting in like you hung the moon and, and everybody oohs and ahs when we get there. That ain't the way it is. That ain't the way he's saying. He said, let nothing be done. Uh, uh, preeminence. Well, promoting yourself. You ever met anybody, all they want to do is promote their self? Uh, uh, wind up causing a church split most of the time. The greatest cure for the problems in any church is for everybody to put that verse in practice. Let nothing be done through strife. I can do it better than him. But you should have listened to me. I don't. I don't, I don't like this. You, uh, you should. I, I don't agree. I, why didn't I get to? I. You know, look, there's things I don't agree with. There's things we do I don't disagree, I disagree with. There's things I do that I look back and say, I shouldn't have done that. I've made a lot of mistakes, but we're not going to fight over it. We're not going to fuss over it. We're just taking and say, oh, well, learn to do better next time, right? That's the right attitude to have. And uh, uh, we're just, we're all, look, we're all in school. We're all in school as a Christian. And there ain't no graduates walking around down on this earth. Nobody's graduated. Nobody. You don't graduate to go to heaven. We're students. We're all learning. We're all just sinners saved by grace. One preacher put it like this. He said, all we are is one beggar telling another beggar where they can find some bread. That's what we are, really. One beggar telling another beggar where they can find bread. So uh, be careful about strutting yourself and getting the idea that maybe you're a little bit above others or a little more spiritual or a little more well-to-do, or whatever. I mean, if you make $200,000 a year, praise God, I'm happy for you. I hope everybody does and pay you tithe. Really, I mean that. Uh, but don't look down on somebody that don't have anything. Uh, those kids we had here Sunday, I'm telling you, that little boy, oh, that broke my heart. That one Kelly had me pick up for her Sunday morning. I don't know if they've got kicked out yet or not, but it looks like, looks like they're going to, kicked out of the house. Can you imagine? And dad in jail, and just Mimi and kid. And that's tough. That's tough. So uh, don't don't do that. Okay, let's let's go a little a little further here. And you'll never you'll never have a better example for this than the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. So this would solve the world's problems. Uh, verse four would solve every church problem. Would solve every church problem. Look not on every man on his own things. But every man on also on the things of others. Amen. See, so where you get that? This man being you, which is in Christ Jesus. Now we're getting ready to get on that in a minute. But look, here's what he said. He said, You know what? If we could train ourselves to think, I'm going, I'm going to look at other people and their needs more than just mine all the time. That's what he's saying. Look not everything on his own on your own thing. You say, well, if, if nobody takes nobody won't take care of me, I'll have to take care of myself. No, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. You worry about other people and help them a little bit, and you watch God take care of you. You don't have to worry about God taking care of you. Uh, we're we're hung up, brother, on, on ourself. Uh, uh, if we would consider others, what a difference it would make. Here's our generation. Two little boys on a pony. I mean, one of them little ponies you put 50 cent in, and they're both riding like that, riding like that. And, and the other looked at him and he said, If one of us would get off here, I could ride better. That's our generation. If one of us get off, I could ride better. That means you're getting off. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the Bible, the Bible will teach us, hey, you ride first, 
then all right. It's human nature. Listen, Frankie and Molly, it's, it's all the time. I want something to do. One wants to do that. One wants to do that. Uh, coming down here tonight, that we're singing. We're singing. It's not a very spiritual song, but I mix spiritual songs in with it. I thought, I thought, Danny caught looking at my window. You know, that ain't right. That ain't right. But but we I get the get spiritual part in it. With a we hat and we tell, I hope he don't get in though. For underneath that furry hat, he looked like that old putty cat. But he don't know I got a baseball bat. Hey! I know it ain't him because Danny ain't got no claws. And I tell him that, that Santa Claus is not real. That's Tweety Bird. Saint Walton don't want the putty cat to get in and eat him. Y'all do know that, right? Don't y'all know that song? Y'all don't know? You should. If you grew up in America and you don't know Tweety Bird and the putty cat. But uh, anyway, uh, Frankie, he said, Frankie said, let the little kids sing it. Because <laughs> Molly was singing it. I said, who's the little kid? Me. <laughs> yeah. So you know what he's saying? I want her to shut up and me sing. That's human nature. I said, all right, Molly, be quiet. Let him sing it. He sang it the best he could. I said, no, you be quiet and let her sing it. Let others esteem others better than themselves. You have to work on that. You ain't naturally like that. We are not naturally made to put other people first, y'all. Next time you go to Walmart, watch yourself. You see somebody else coming, you'll hurry up to get in that line there. It's me first, you next. That's human nature. And, and it's okay we're made like that, but the Bible teaches we're supposed to be servants and help other people. You got to work on that. You got to work on that, buddy. You, you got to, what a difference it would make if we said, I'm going to get off and let you ride. And then I want, we're, we're scared. Well, if I do that, he won't ever let me ride. See, that's, we're always thinking about old number one right here. And men, men are worse. I think men are worse than women today. Women are more giving and kind, loving. Usually men are more selfish as a general rule. But uh, you got to work on that, y'all. You have to work on it. Not just saying me, my needs, my wants. That's all that matters. And ladies, too, you have to, you have to, don't be a mommy dearest uh, and be an old witch just wanting your way all the time. Uh, it let each esteem others better than themselves. My goodness. What if we all, what if we memorize verse three? Uh, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. No matter what comes up, let me say, okay, you go ahead. That's against our nature. We have self-preservation. And, and that's okay. Self-preservation is the strongest uh, impulse and, a, and that a person has. will stay alive at any cost. But you, you as a Christian, and we're getting ready to read about it. We're getting ready to read about it. We won't get to it all tonight. We'll have to get into it uh, next, next week, Lord willing. But as a Christian, Jesus could have called 10,000 angels and got him off the cross. But he esteemed others and gave his life on the cross. That, that, he's the perfect example. You want an example to follow? Look at this. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, I'm just going to read it now. We'll have to come back and study it. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Good night, y'all. Look how different that is. Now, people, you know what girls are taught? Kids are taught now to market themselves. I want everybody to know me. I want to be famous. I want people to know who I am. Jesus, who had a right to be popular and famous, made himself of no reputation. He had no itinerary. He had no resume that he sent out. He didn't put a big post on Facebook saying, I am now available to come to your town and heal everybody that's sick or, or anything like that. He, uh, he didn't promote himself. He didn't promote himself. He, listen, if you serve God, if you're a preacher, you serve God, you don't have to promote yourself. God will God'll put you where he wants you and doing what you want you to. Or anybody else for that matter. Don't have to be a preacher. But look at look what he said. Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. See, he was God in heaven 
And he came down to this earth and took on the form of a servant, like a slave, brother. And he said, I was made, he was made in the likeness of men. He had hands, eyes, just like me and you. He had a human nature. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. My, 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 my. What, what verses of scripture? What, what in the world? Uh, the world teaches you the exact opposite. Here's what the world teaches you. And I've had people say this to me. I've lived for other people long enough. It's about time I made myself happy. I've had people tell me that. I've had two or three women tell me that right before they left their husband. And it turned into a disaster. One told me, said, my husband just takes everything I do, and the kids, all gone. I'm tired of living for other people. I think it's time I, you know where you get that? You get that off TV and out the world. That's the world's philosophy. Ain't the devil come here. You, you're doing these dishes and raising these kids. Nobody don't appreciate you. And your old husband, he ain't no count and all that. You're wasting your life, girl. Look at all them handsome guys at work that would love to have somebody like you. And all those girls, and I say, he'll make you think like that. He'll make the man think like that. Man, you're working yourself to death and nobody appreciates it. Your wife don't appreciate it. And then he'll wave something in front of you. You know what the Lord did? Uh, it said uh, he, he humbled himself and became obedient. Even the death of the cross, buddy. That's a classic scripture uh, of the example of what we've been studying tonight. You want to study in humility? Jesus Christ. Buddy, you want to study, you want to study in how to do treat other people? Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, brother. I mean, look at how he dealt with people. And you know what? We're far short, ain't we? I am. I'm far short of that. My goal is I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be. But boy, oh boy, this flesh don't like that. This flesh wants its way. This flesh wants its uh, stuff. And God's not mean. He'll let you have stuff. God, he don't, God's not against you having a nice house or car or clothes or money. Or nothing. The Lord's not against that. But when you run over other people to get it and you hurt other people and you cheat other people or you push other people down to stand on top of them, then that's, that's wrong. That's wrong. Jesus humbled himself and came a man. And uh, uh, this is some of the classic scripture on the deity of Christ, of course. Uh, we'll we'll look at that in just a minute. I'm, I'm, we're going to stop here in just a couple of minutes, but let's look at that uh, just a little bit here before we come back to this next week. But made himself of no reputation. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 6. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Look at that. Now, there is a verse of Scripture Showing you that Jesus Christ was God in flesh. Now, let's do a little Bible study here. Take your Bible and turn over to 1 Timothy. Over to your right there a little bit. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And if you've got the King James Bible, you'll get this right. If you've got the modern versions, it don't even have this in it. Uh, with the right words. It, it twists it around a little bit. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. This is the reason you don't want the NIV or the RSV or the ESV or the new ASV. They don't have this verse right. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery. It's a great mystery of godliness. God, capital G, God, the only God there is. God that made heaven and earth was manifest in the flesh. That's Jesus Christ on this earth. God Almighty became flesh. Now there's your verse that proved. If you got the modern version, it don't say God's manifest in the flesh. It'll say he who was, or who who ye was, or he who was, or he was. Uh, that could, uh, listen, it just saying he was manifest in the flesh, that ain't saying nothing. I was manifest in the flesh. You was manifest in the flesh. That verse said God was manifest in the flesh. See that? See that? Learn that verse right there because you're going to meet people like, I don't know, Jehovah Witnesses and other groups that don't know or care or understand. And you might meet some sincere person wanting to know what, what the Trinity is, why we believe. You ever heard anybody say that? Why do y'all believe in the Trinity? Uh, you know, we believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. You say, why do you believe that? 
Because the Bible says that. The Bible teaches that. God manifests in three persons. One God, three persons. We don't believe in three gods. You don't believe in one plus one plus one equals three. You believe in one times one times one equals one. He's God. He's manifest in three persons. And it's a great mystery. That means you can't figure it out. I've heard people say, well, how could he be God up there in heaven and Jesus down here? How? He said, there's, there's Jesus. And he said he got thirsty. You tell me, how can God get thirsty? Because he was man. That was the man part of him got thirsty. He's all God and all man. He wasn't half God and half man. He's 100% God and 100% man. You say, well, I can't understand that. Nobody else can either. It's a great mystery. But it's true. Hallelujah. Y'all, hallelujah. Ain't you glad he come down here and said, look, I'll show you how to do this and did it and went back to heaven. And when God sees me now, he don't see my life. He sees his life. Put on my record. Woo! That's shouting ground, people. Which By which will we are sanctified. Jesus' life is put on our record. That's shouting ground. Amen. I'm going to have to stop. Get back in this next week. It's a deity of Christ. Um, um, you see that. Uh, let's look at maybe one more verse right quick. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians. Back to the left there a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. We see it again. In whom the God. See that 2 Corinthians 4, 4. In whom the God. That's little g. That would be the devil. That's the devil. The God of this world. Hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Here it is. Who is the image of God. Should shine on them. Jesus Christ is God's image. Now. Give you something to think about until next week. God made Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The Bible said God made man in his own image. Then Adam sinned. And he lost that. That's why it's really not correct when people say, well, God made all of us in his image. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He made one man in his image, Adam. And the rest of them were in Adam's. In Adam begot a son after his own likeness in a fallen state. You really don't think God wanted us like this, do you? <laughs> Lord, no. What a mess we are. Uh, we're in a fallen state. We, we was made in God's image. We lost it. And nobody had God's image again till Jesus Christ showed up. And guess what? When we die and get our new body, we'll be in passing like in his glorious body. We'll have that image of that like Adam did back in the Garden of Eden. All right. We'll stop right there. Let's bow our head for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. Thank you for the endless, boundless, unsearchable riches of the Word of God. I pray that every person here has been challenged to study, to show themselves approved, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Have you in our hearts tonight. Bless everybody as we go. Bless all the kids back there, Lord, and God just give them a uh, a good time at the Christmas play. And Lord, I pray that you'd bless winter camp. Uh, Lord, coming up and the, and the play and all the special services that we're having. Thank you, Lord, for a good year. It's been a good year, Lord. And we're not the end of it yet, but Lord, we didn't say this far. You sure have blessed us this year. Thank you for your blessing. Put your blessings on Shining Light Baptist Church. Bless those that are sick. Bless those that are, that are backslid and cold. Lord, help them to get back right. God, move in here Sunday morning with great power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless y'all. We'll have a good evening.